What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Tunic. Tunic is a pretty interesting little title that blends a lot of elements from Legends of Zelda and a Souls-like. However, before we jump into that, just to get my usual stuff out of the way, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform. 100% does include the achievements, but it also includes more than that. If you check out the channel and you're not subscribed, first video you'll see is a video explaining everything that I cover here, and my Steam profile is linked in the description below. But that said, today's video will differ a little bit from my usual format as Tunic is a fairly short game and with shorter games like this there's just not as much need to break the videos up in my normal format. So for my regular audience this will be a tiny bit different from my normal reviews as in total a single playthrough of the main story will likely run you about 10 hours or so. And 100% completion is like a 20 to 30 hour endeavor I would say, kind of depending on how long some of the puzzles take you. But the core elements of the game really revolve around again Legend of Zelda and a Souls-like game. So the Souls-like elements are that it has a pretty vague plot that doesn't really come together until the end, honestly, for a few different reasons that we'll get into. But on top of this, it's also the crux of some of the gameplay. For instance, you'll rest at shrines. This will then reset enemies that are in the area, which you can then kill for a currency that doubles as your actual money and then as your experience when you go to power up certain stats. And ultimately, it's like a simplified Dark Souls souls in that way. Now the Legend of Zelda side of things is more of the puzzles and the exploration and kind of figuring out little things in dungeons, that type of stuff. But from there, let's talk a little bit about the story. So as I mentioned, it's kind of vague. I'm not going to be spoiling it too much here. Normally, I like to give a plot setup, kind of what the story would be about. However, truth be told, you don't really find out much about the story until it kind of all comes together towards the end of the game. So kind of anything I give you would be a spoiler in that regard. But ultimately, as you play through the game, you'll be collecting pieces of a journal. This journal is your hint to everything, down to to what you need to do, which is usually not told to you, so you kind of just need to read and flip through the journal to figure stuff out. And then towards the end of the game, once this journal gets more and more complete, and then eventually might actually be complete, it will finally kind of reveal the actual story and explain what is going on. And to that end, what surprised me is that there are actually two separate endings to Tunic. However, you can get both in one playthrough because the game lets you restart, so to speak, if you get a bad ending, meaning that it'll take you to the end of the game before the cutoff point, if you will. And and to get the good ending, all you have to do is find all of the pages of the journal, which will then explain the full plot to you. So kind of an interesting way to tackle the story. And in general, I would say despite the kind of childish art style here, or an art style that appeals to kids, I should say, the game itself gets kind of sinister in the back half. It goes from like this cutesy stuff to things being much more dark and it has a lot of, again, just kind of sinister undertones that caught me a little off guard as up to that point outside of the combat, it was fairly run of the mill. But in terms of character progression, we are of course playing as this little fox and progression primarily comes through weapons and items as you go. So as you play through the game, you'll find about five or six different weapons, starting with a stick and then ending up with things like a sword and you can even get a gun later in the game. And then in Dark Souls fashion, you can level up at shrines once you get enough currency as well as the level up items. Each stat has an item associated with it and you'll have to get one of those items and then enough currency or experience points to then level that attribute up to the next. But this is pretty basic. It's just stuff like attack, health, that kind of thing. But it does make your life a little easier. And that brings us to gameplay. Now, interestingly enough, this title is somewhat open world, actually, in that, for the most part, you're free to explore. This is a little bit reined in by certain things being kind of off limits until you get certain pieces of equipment, but by and large, you're free to go more or less wherever you want, which is nice in that it kind of facilitates some freedom of approach in how you actually tackle the game and the objectives you need to complete, even if you're not entirely sure what those happen to be. However, there are parts of the map that serve as more or less dungeons, and these are like little gauntlets of enemies and challenges, the occasional puzzle, that kind of thing. And overall, it's pretty fun. However, with this being a shorter indie title, I would tell you there's not a ton of variation in this regard because it's, a, again, a relatively short title, which means the map itself is a bit on the small side. So you should see more or less everything the game has to offer pretty quickly. And then the back half, especially if you want to 100% it, really just boils down to solving all of the various puzzles. And this boils down to the arrow keys on keyboard and mouse or the D-pad 
if you're playing on controller. The D-pad is often referred to as the Holy Cross throughout sections of this game, and I mention this because most of the puzzles revolve around using the arrow keys or the D-pad to input a certain sequence, which is kind of a bummer as, again, basically all of the in-game puzzles kind of boil down to some variation of that. There are a few more elaborate puzzles where you have to put a lot of work into finding out what order you're supposed to be pressing them in, but a lot of them it's very straightforward. If you like puzzles, there is plenty of them. And something that tends to actually make these puzzles a little difficult is the language in the game is not anything you would recognize. It's its own little language that actually is crackable, so to speak, and they use these little runes of sorts to actually spell out everything, and very little of it is translated to anything you can understand, meaning that a lot of it is visual and context clues. So unfortunately, it's made difficult by the fact that you can't understand a lot of what the game is saying unless you put in the effort to actually crack this language or just, you know, look it up. That brings us to combat, which we'll talk about before we start wrapping this thing up. And mostly it's pretty good. It's fun, but I would say, again, with the relative lack of variety in terms of the weapons and the enemies themselves at a certain point, the regular enemies get kind of routine. You get to a point where they're not really a big deal to deal with, especially once you get more and more equipment under your belt. The end game, if you will, unfortunately turns into a bit of a slog of enemies where they seem to counter this by just putting you in situations where your max health gets reduced down to nothing until you go rest again, or they just put you in an absolute gauntlet of enemies where there's so many it's hard to get all of them at once. Now, an interesting thing about combat is that the probably most Souls-like part of this game are the boss fights, which are actually really cool and can actually be quite difficult in comparison to the rest. I would tell you though, with this being a relatively chill game, if you couldn't get that by the art style and everything else, there is actually an options uh, item, if you will, for just straight up invincibility. So if that's your goal, it's literally baked into the game, you can just go turn it on. However, for the people that want that challenge, the bosses are actually a lot of fun to engage with in this way and can be quite the little challenge. But that's going to bring us to positives and negatives for this particular review. Again, relatively short game. Now, on the positive side of things, it was pretty fun overall. For a relatively short experience, I had a good time. Until, of course, you get to the point where it's just puzzles left, basically, and then it's kind of a bummer. But the actual run through the story and kind of deciphering everything, I thought that was well done, especially in combination with the art style. And they used the camera angle to even kind of hide and manipulate some information, if you will, so I thought that was a nice touch as well. And the other positive for me was the no hand-holding. While it would have been nice if there were slightly more context to some of the things you like need to go do because a lot of the times you're questioning what you even need to go get done. However, beyond that, the lack of hand-holding and the relative freedom to approach the game how you want or in the order you want, if you will, was pretty cool, especially for a smaller title like this. I do have a neutral point, which is unusual for me, and that is the art style. Personally, it didn't bother me, but I can tell you for sure some people will simply never play this game because of the way that it looks, so something to keep in mind. On the negative side of things, the back end or the last half or so of this game, if you want to see everything, is just nothing but puzzles. Now, it is optional to some degree. However, if you want the true ending, you're going to have to do quite a few of them. So if you want to see the actual good ending to the game, you're going to have to put in a lot of work on these puzzles. And as soon as you figure out what the majority of the puzzles consist of, it's relatively straightforward and it kind of just becomes a repetitive slog, in my opinion, which was kind of a negative for me. But that's pretty much all I've got for you guys. So to draw it to a conclusion, Tunic is a fun game that can be enjoyed in a relatively short period of time. So in that way, it's pretty good. I would tell you, though, that there's a relatively limited amount of content as a result. So while I enjoyed it, I would tell you that this is a title that is tedious to 100%. So my recommendation to most people in this regard, since people tend to ask me about this, is that this is a title that, unless you're just really into 100%ing things, I would just run through the game enough to get the true ending and then call it as the back half with the puzzles and all that stuff just really doesn't add a lot to the experience unless you're just super into this particular game. But beyond that, it was a very enjoyable experience. Now, I would tell you, though, that this game is $30, and considering the game itself is likely only to 
take you about 10 hours. And even if you 100% it, it's about 20. And at that point, you're seeing a ton of repetition in the content. For me, this is a buy on sale. I enjoyed it a lot, but I think the price is a little high for the overall amount of what you're getting. So if you can catch this on sale, then I think it would be a good buy for people. Overall, pretty enjoyable game. It tries and does some interesting things, mostly successfully. So I will be watching to see what their developer, Tunic Team, does next. I'm very curious what, if anything, they can go on to do from here. There you guys go. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.